You're listening to The Artist Athlete, episode 31. Hey, friends, fans, and enemies. I'm Shannon McKenna, and I'm the host of The Artist Athlete podcast and the founder of theartistathlete.com. This podcast is dedicated to circus. Usually, it's a place for professionals in the industry to share their stories, viewpoints, and information. But today, I'm going on a bit of a tangent and bringing on a different kind of guest to provide some incredibly important information about a topic that rarely gets discussed. And that topic is money. Now, Actually, I talk about money at the beginning of every show when I tell you that this podcast is paid for entirely by donations from Patreons. And if you want to help continue the podcast, you can go to patreon.com slash the artist athlete. Again, it's patreon.com slash the artist athlete. My guest today is not a circus performer. In order to properly introduce her, I feel like I have to tell you a story about myself and how she relates to my own journey. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you know I like to keep the intros short, but today I felt like I needed to offer this story to provide some context. So in 2017, last year, um, which is crazy, it feels like so much longer ago, uh, but I, I went through a really rough time. My boyfriend of almost four years and I broke up after I was working backstage on a show he was in in Australia. Uh, so I flew from Australia to Montreal, just like crying my heart out with um, the money I had made from working backstage on this show. And I flew to Montreal to continue my own training. And This was pretty much the cycle of my life. I would perform or give some workshops. I would make some money. um, And then I would spend the money I had to create new work or travel to work with coaches who could up my level and just pray the next contract or the next gig or workshop opportunity would come along and save me or tide me over. But I was in this place where I, I just couldn't do that anymore. I was tired and I was heartbroken and I knew I, I needed some kind of change. And so because I'm a super drastic and dramatic human being, uh, I decided that I was just going to like pull the plug and quit aerial work. I was going to quit circus altogether. I stopped training. I stopped teaching. I stopped pursuing any kind of dream that I had. I stopped performing. I turned down a bunch of work that was offered to me. And I canceled all of the lessons with both of the coaches I was working with. And um, then I was just in Montreal with all the time in the world to kill. I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. So um, I would just stress Google is what I call it. I would like go down the Google rabbit hole of like, what do normal people do with their lives? What should I do? Because I, I, I had no idea. I had been in the arts pretty much my entire life. I went to school for theater and then right out of that started training and performing and teaching in the circus world. And one of those, during one of those um, stress Google benders I was on, I happened upon the blog of a woman named Paula Pant. Now, Paula Pant quit her job as a newspaper reporter. She traveled the world. And when she returned to the States, she started a business as a freelance writer. She invested in real estate. And by the time she was 30 years old, she found herself with a net worth of over a million dollars. So she has a blog. It's called Afford Anything, and she has a podcast with the same name where she shares exactly how she did this and helps others make financial choices that align with their life values. And so what I would do, because I had all this free time now that I wasn't just like training and partying and sending emails and sleeping, was that I would take these like four hour long walks around Montreal and I just binge listened to all of po- Paula's podcasts about personal finance and becoming financially independent through real estate. And I found all of this totally fascinating. Because if y'all haven't figured out by now, I'm actually like a total nerd. 
So anyway, about six months later, and of course, I'm leaving out a ton of stuff in between, but um, about six months later, maybe nine months in February of 2018, I wrote my first ebook. I formed my company, The Artist Athlete. I actually had some savings, and I started to produce my own podcast to help my community. And on my podcast, which is the podcast you're listening to right now, I have this question that I ask at the end of every show. And that question is, what advice would you give to yourself at the beginning of your career? And I I would like to say that I was surprised when I heard this answer, but I wasn't really because of what I had experienced. Um, people in that advice often, not always, of course, if you've listened to a few episodes, people give great advice of all different kinds, but... So often, the subject of saving your money or learning how to deal with money or taxes came up over and over again. And it became clear to me that one of the things myself and a certain faction of the current next generation of artists, um, not even circus artists, but many different types of artists, need to talk about money and what to do with it and have a talk about it, not in like a boring or um, laborious kind of way, but in a way that empowers us. I keep thinking maybe if there is more inf- education and information about financial planning, we'd have more artists who could afford to take a risk and create their own companies rather than working for the big ones. Maybe in the U.S. we'd have the kind of circus culture I see in countries with government socialized support structures for artists. Maybe we'd have more people who could dedicate their lives to building reflections for humanity so we could all appreciate our individual and yet unified existences on this one precious earth a little deeper. And so, friends, fans, and enemies... I decided that I was going to try to get the woman who inspired me to start taking control of my finances onto the Artist Athlete podcast. And I was absolutely shocked when she agreed. I prepared so much for this interview, I was so nervous, but I did my best to encompass many different situations that I observed from friends over the years, my own experience, and guests I've had on this show. I didn't want to get the discussion too complicated or wrapped up in too many um, kind of finance speak jargon. But luckily, she is really good about talking these about these complex issues in a way that's really down to earth. So I'm very excited to introduce this interview to you all. And I will do a wrap up at the end of the show. But uh, just even at the beginning, if you're not already on the Facebook group, Friends of the Artist Athlete Podcast, and you have responses to this interview, I would love to hear them there. Or as always, you can email me info at theartistathlete.com. Uh, but without further ado, and I cannot believe I get to say this, but here is my interview with Paula Pant. Paula Pant, <laughs> welcome to the Artist Athlete Podcast. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. I'm so excited that you're here. I've been such a fan for so long. Um, Can you tell the people, my audience, um, who you are and what you do? Sure. My name is Paula Pant. I have a blog called Afford Anything, and I have a podcast called the Afford Anything Podcast. But before all of that, I quit my job about 10 years ago. Um, I was a newspaper reporter back in the day. Uh, And I quit my job because I... I only had two weeks of vacation a year, and I didn't want to live like that. And so um, at the time that I quit, I was making $31,000 per year. That's the most money that I've ever made at being employed by somebody else. Um, and I I quit my job. I had a little bit of savings, so I went and traveled for a while. I backpacked um, primarily in countries where the dollar exchange rate really worked in my favor. So I spent a bunch of time in Southeast Asia. And but when I came back to the U.S., I just wanted to be a full-time freelancer. So I, um, I started picking up gigs as a freelance writer. And it took a while, but ultimately that, that grew and grew and grew and grew. And eventually it was, uh, I had enough clients that I was making a, a good six-figure income as a freelance writer. Uh, and while all of this was going on, I was living in Atlanta uh, and I, <laughs> as as you do, yes. And uh, 
<clears throat> so I was living with, there were five of us sharing a three bedroom apartment, uh, uh, random people from, uh, it was me, my boyfriend at the time and random people from Craigslist, you know, who were all sharing the five of us all sharing this like three bedroom apartment. Nice. And, uh, I noticed that this house that was across the street, it was a triplex. Uh, I noticed it was for sale. And so we bought it, um, moved rented out two of the units moved our roommates in with us and lived in that third unit by doing that we were able to get our own out-of-pocket housing costs to zero so we were living for free quote I, I say free quote like in in quotes because of course there was the opportunity cost right we are like taking up rent that we otherwise wouldn't have been receiving but but we were living quote unquote for free meaning we weren't paying anything right. um and uh, so then because we were living for free, we could save pretty aggressively. And so we just kept saving uh, money from freelance writing and kept buying more and more properties. And eventually my net worth topped a million dollars by doing that. So that's my story pretty much. That's so awesome. So. Um, I'm really interested in the moment in your life when you decided to not go back to your office job. And you built this business and you started doing all of that. What was that like? There were a couple of moments. Um, so it wasn't just one moment. It was a few. Like when I was in college, I really wanted to study abroad. But I, I, those programs were super expensive. It was like $15,000 for a semester. Mm -hmm. And so I remember thinking, you know what? I don't actually want to study. I just want to go abroad. And it would be a lot cheaper if I graduate and then travel. So when I graduated from college, the thing I really wanted to do was travel, but I was a college graduate. I had no money. So I got a job because I wanted to save up money to go travel. So so it wasn't like, oh, I was happily working at this job and all of a sudden I decided to quit. Uh, I, right from the beginning, right from the day I graduated from college, before I ever got my first job, I always in the back of my mind had this plan that I would work for a few years, save up enough money to go travel, and then I would quit and I would go travel. So that was, that was like kind of point number one in this story. Mm -hmm. But I always imagined that after traveling, I would go back to working for somebody else because I had no idea that there was any alternative. Like I just had no concept that you could work for yourself. Um, and that realization came about during the, the three years that I was working at the newspaper. Uh, I started meeting freelance journalists. I would go to like journalism meetups and journalism conferences and at these at the journalism conferences, there were these sessions that were broken out as newspaper, radio, magazine, television. And then there was a session, this track for freelance. Uh, that was how hmm. I figured out that it was even possible to work for yourself, that it was possible to make money without being employed by somebody else. And once I figured that out, I was like, whoa, could I do that? Um, and so while I was still at the newspaper, I started freelancing um, just just a little bit here and there. But it, that did two things. Number one, it allowed me to save money. And I saved like maybe I, on average about $800 a month doing that, uh, which was substantial, you know, like when you're making 30000 a year. Yeah. So, yeah, it allowed me th to have that side income. But more than that, it also the really the biggest thing that it did for me was it built my confidence, like seeing that I could freelance while I was still at my day job gave me the confidence to know that this was possible. I could pick up clients. I could get these types of gigs. Um, and so that was why when I came back to the U.S. after traveling, you know, when I thought about waking up to an alarm and getting in my car and sitting in like that stupid Atlanta bumper to bumper traffic, uh -huh. like, ugh, you know, like that just sounded so unappealing. Uh, and and having to buy an iron and iron my clothes. Oh, I hadn't like, even thought of that. Right? Right? Exactly. I think like you don't have to nylon unitard spandex as exact. a circus artist. <laughs> 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 oh, man. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Like, I think really this has just been a really, really elaborate scheme to like not buy an ironing board is what oh, yeah. this has been. <laughs> Well, I think you've succeeded. Do you have an ironing board now? I do not. Nice. I never have. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> so when did this become 
a movement toward, and maybe we should back up, but the FIRE movement is something that you're incredibly active in. Mm -hmm. Um, Can you explain what FIRE is? Absolutely. So FIRE is not a reference to any kind of fire art or spinning poi, although that's (laughs) super cool. Um, FIRE is an acronym for Financial Independence Retire Early. And financial independence is, uh, I define it as the point at which you have enough passive income, which is typically income that comes from your investments, Um, the point at which you have enough passive income that that passive income can cover your bills. And once you reach that point, some people, and this is kind of a semantic, I guess, but some people define that as early retirement because your passive income could cover your bills and so you could theoretically retire if you wanted to. So that's that's where the RE part of the FIRE acronym comes from. I don't actually like calling it retirement or early retirement because I love working. I, I'm, ha- I, I'm happiest when I'm working a lot of times. And so to me, the purpose was, or the, the, the concept is really not about retirement in the way that a lot of people conceptualize that word. To me, the idea is really that that independence, the having enough passive income to know that that money can co- can pay your bills, um, and you're not going to have to stress out about keeping the lights on, buying groceries, anything like that. You know, it's interesting. I, I listened to your interview with Susie Orman, which con- <laughs> well done. Um, Thank you. <laughs> well done, and yeah, it, it, this word retirement. Uh, has such an interesting meaning for Susie, for you. Um, But I also, I come from a population of people who retire, quote unquote, pretty early, um, Mm -hmm. well before they are eligible to exit the workforce. My population is aerialists or acrobats or dancers, most of whom, and there are obviously a lot of exceptions to this, uh, but generally end their careers, whether it's because of their body or because they want to get off the road and they want to make different lifestyle choices, uh, generally end their careers in their early to mid thirties mm-hmm. uh, is when they retire. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a really good point. There are people who retire, quote, like they'll retire without reaching financial independence. So they'll retire from a career or Um, from an industry and switch to a different one. Which is kind of what I wanted to bring you on the show for today. Mm -hmm. Um, Because a lot of these people uh, live in fear of that retirement. So let's talk about financial independence then, because that is the key to all of this. Like, whether or not you're going to retire, basically, once once you reach the point at which your investments are paying your bills everything becomes a lot easier, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not talking about a lavish lifestyle. You know, I'm not talking about your investments are uh, allowing you to fly first class and, and, I don't know, buy some fancy cars. I'm not talking about anything like that, right? We're not talking about diamonds and tigers. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. I'm talking about, like, you just have enough investments that produce enough income that you can... You can keep the lights on, you can put food in the fridge, you can fill the, your gas tank. Like when you get to the point where those things are no longer worrying you because you have enough investments to cover them, that it just it changes your entire mindset and, and and that fear that you mentioned about, you know, okay, if I do retire, what do I do next? How am I gonna support myself? Like that fear it doesn't entirely go away. It never goes away fully. Sure. But the anxiety gets reduced a little bit, knowing that in the worst case scenario, you can still survive. You can still float yourself. It might not be like the lifestyle that you want, but it it's at least enough that your bases are covered. Okay, so for me, I'll just share the numbers. So my rental properties last year, uh, they brought in gross revenue of 125000 And after paying all of the bills, like after the mortgages and repairs and maintenance and paying the property managers and, and all of that, the net amount that was left over was $43,000. So last year, my rental properties produced $43,000 in income, in, in residual passive income. Would you recommend that to other people? to uh, invest in real estate 
versus the stock market? Oh, they're both good. I mean, do whichever one calls to you. Like you have to, you know, you have to want to own rental properties in order to be good at it. Mm. And also you have to want to have your money exposed to stocks uh, and be willing to deal with the volatility of the market, the ups mm-hmm. and downs, if you're going to be good at it. So regardless of which one you choose or if you choose a combination of both, you have to want it. Otherwise, like wanting it is the foundation of all of this. And I think that that's another kind of interesting point that I have observed in people who are living the lifestyle that I'm talking about, where they love what they're doing. They don't want to retire. But the retirement age is so early (laughs) that they kind of push off or don't think about uh, future options or ideas. And so if you're living a life like that, how would you suggest as someone who has it? I respect that. But Mm -hmm. how what are some strategies that people like that could use to start saving and investing and thinking about this? Well, ultimately, in terms of saving, ultimately, everything boils down to the gap between what you earn and what you spend. That, at the most fundamental level, that's what savings is. And so no matter no matter what, no matter what type of lifestyle you're living, no matter whether your income comes from an employer versus 1099s, you earn X and you spend Y. And the greater the distance between X and Y, the more savings you have. Uh, and it's it's pretty much that simple. Yeah, um, that's pretty simple math. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why is it so hard for people to do that? We tell ourselves stories. And so it's very easy to tell yourself the story of, oh, I'm a freelancer, therefore I don't make much. Or, oh, I'm an artist, therefore I don't make much. And sometimes these stories become our identities. And if you identify as somebody who doesn't make much, then I think at a subconscious level, like your energy doesn't accept anything to the contrary, because anything to the contrary would be a fundamental shakeup of your your core identity. Like if you're the type of person, I was at a party the other day, and I was talking to this guy, he's a screenwriter, and he was telling me about this uh, thing that he had just written, uh, like a script that he had just written about a vampire, and he meant it to be a little bit of an allegory. Hmm. So um, he was like, oh yeah, it's a vampire story, and he was like, it's a bit of an allegory of the rich preying on the poor. And I just, I, I thought to myself at that moment, and yes, many people have done many, many bad things. That's absolutely true. And it is also true that if you have this mindset where you think that all rich people are evil, then of course you're not going to want to become rich because you, you don't want to be evil. So if you have that kind of mindset the like, oh, rich people are bad, rich people are evil, money doesn't matter, then your life is going to reflect that. Or the the thing I hear a lot is, oh, they're artists, they're not good with money. We're not responsible with our money. Where if you become responsible with your money, you're no longer an artist. Right, right, exactly. Like it, it gives you some sort of street cred in a way. To be to be starving, to be the yeah, starving artist. Totally. Because if you're if you're successful, people start calling you a sellout. There's this attitude that that there is some sort of nobility that comes from that, that comes from just not doing well. Like, oh, I'm I'm struggling for my art. I'm suffering for my art. Where do you but think it that comes from? I think that people who are struggling need to tell themselves that in order to feel better, and then eventually that just becomes a culturally accepted norm Mm. and and then it becomes self-defeating you tell yourself certain things in order to feel better but then by repeating those things to yourself you identify with it so much that those stories those ideas keep you in place you know And, and that's this is not to discount that there are genuine struggles out there absolutely there are genuine hardships there are bills there are medical emergencies there's there's all kinds of stuff out there that's absolutely true And thinking back to that screenwriter that I was talking to the other day, and it's also true that this guy who says, oh, the rich are preying on the poor, is he ever going to sit down and devise a plan by which he would save $1,000 per month, even if that meant living with a whole bunch of roommates 
and eating vegetarian food uh, and not drinking any alcohol and whatever it took in order to be able to save that money, is he going to sit down and come up with a plan that would allow him to save a thousand a month and then invest that money in an an index fund at an eight percent return and then map out how long it would take for that to grow to be a hundred thousand dollars? Do you think he's really going to do that if he has this attitude of like people with money are evil? Right, because that would be something a person with money would do. So that would be evil. Did you have any stories like that? I mean, because I, I know your your history. You didn't grow up with money. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, so I'm an immigrant. Um, well, really, my parents are immigrants. I was born in Kathmandu, Nepal, uh, but I was a baby when I, I came to the U.S. I want to go to Kathmandu so bad. I was in India last year, and a bunch of people were going, and I it it looks so beautiful. Go in either the spring or the fall. The summer is uh, awful. The summer it rains all the time. Okay. So the weather is awful. I should say in the summer. Good to so. know. But so you were born back to sorry mm-hmm. the money stories. You were born in Kathmandu. Yeah, uh, I was born in Kathmandu. I came to the U.S. as a baby. You know, my parents were very, very, very frugal. They, like my mom, would clip coupons for hours. And she always knew that bread was cheaper at one store, but milk was cheaper at the other. (laughs) And, you know, she would go to three or four different stores with like a stack of coupon for each store and, and divide up her grocery list between these different stores because that would allow her to save $8 off of each bill. So I grew up watching my parents be extremely conscientious about their money. And I think that that led to me being extremely conscientious about it. And one of the stories that I really had to battle is I have this tendency to be too frugal. Like I sometimes think that frugality is the only answer. And so I've had to accept the fact that, uh, and it's been hard for me, uh, that if the goal is to grow that gap between what you earn and what you spend, there are two ways to widen the gap. You could spend less, you could earn more, or you could do a combination of both. And I was really good at the spending less part, but it was hard for me to wrap my head around the earning more part. But, you know, by being very conscientious about my money, I got to the point, you know, when you're living five people in a three bedroom apartment, <laughs> at, driving a 15 year old car, eating vegetarian food from Costco, you can't really save a whole lot more than that. Not living in the U.S. at least. I, I guess we could put a sixth person in our three bedroom apartment <laughs> or a seventh person. But like you, you start and fast being, on Fridays and yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sure. but you, you start hitting diminishing returns after some time. And so I got to the point where I, I was living so cheaply, there was like it's nothing left to cut. And so the only direction I could go in was earning more. And by focusing on, on that great thing about being a freelancer is you can take on as many clients as you could, as there are hours in the day. Right. So I just kept taking on more and more clients and more and more gigs and uh, spent all my time doing that. By doing that, I could build that gap between what I earned and what I spent. Did it just go away over time? Do you still find moments of this? The other day, I ran out of creamer, like coffee creamer. Uh-huh. There's this little, like, I can't even call it a grocery store. That, that would, you know, there's like this little shop that's walking distance from my condo where I live that's extremely overpriced. I remember thinking to myself, I was like, well, I could walk to that little shop, but the coffee creamer there is going to be like three dollars, four dollars, mm-hmm. whatever. I don't know, I, however much it is. Like, it's going to be a, a some ripoff price for coffee creamer, and I didn't want to do it. I, you, I just told you the story of my mom going to all these different stores uh, <laughs> to buy groceries, right? Like, I didn't want to go buy the ripoff coffee creamer, but to go to the grocery store, I'd have to get in my car. And it's 10 minutes to go there and then 10 minutes to come back. So it's a 20-minute round-trip drive. And I I seriously considered spending that extra 20 minutes to save a few dollars. So, yeah, I still I still have those knee-jerk moments of, like, excessive frugality. It becomes excessive to the point where when it reaches the point where it doesn't align with my values. I value my time. If there are two coffee creamers and they are one is right here 
I can walk to it. And the other is 20 minutes of driving away. Of course, in order to honor my time, it makes sense to pay a couple of extra dollars. That's still something that I have to consciously think about. Interesting. That's amazing that after you, you're a millionaire and you're mm-hmm. thinking about creamer. This podcast is brought to you by The Artist Athlete. Did you know that The Artist Athlete is more than just a podcast? It's a growing online resource for students of the aerial arts to deepen their journey to badassery by accessing techniques approved by physical therapists and master coaches in the industry. Our current spotlight is on the Fundamentals of Aerial Alignment, a practical manual for hanging upside down. This online manual is a step-by-step guide. It is complete with photos, videos, and exercises that you can implement immediately to help you gain the strength and awareness you need for an aerial practice that promotes shoulder health and longevity and good posture upright so you don't walk around like a gorilla. But don't just take my word for it. Here's circus physical therapist Dr. Jen Crane of Cirque Physio to tell you more. The Fundamentals of Aerial Alignment is an absolute must-have for every aerialist of every level. I can't even tell you how many shoulder injuries I treat that are a direct result of rushing past the basics and attempt to get a trick too soon. In the manual, Shannon deconstructs the fundamentals, including the correct muscular engagement to safely arrive in these positions and the rationale for why it matters. Of course, in addition to all of these fabulous pearls of wisdom, the book is also ridiculously fun to read. It's been lovingly garnished with the Shannon humor we all know and love. Thanks, Jen. Cirque Physio is also featured in the book to give scientific insight into why it all works. Pick up your copy today by going to theartistathlete.com and clicking e-manuals. Listeners of the podcast can get a 10% discount by typing in the offer code podcast at checkout. Again, that's theartistathlete.com, offer code podcast. Now, back to the show. I was on a plane the other day and I was watching this documentary about Warren Buffett and how he still goes to McDonald's every morning. And if the stock market is down, he buys a slightly less expensive egg McMuffin. And then if it's doing well, he'll buy like the 319 one. Oh, nice. Yeah. It's so (laughs) funny. Yeah. Oh, I was talking to, um, on my podcast, I I interviewed Clark Howard. You know, he's a a multi, multi multi-millionaire. And he was telling me, um, you know, he always takes Uber pool because he, he just he can't justify having an entire Uber to himself. <laughs> <laughs> and he still lives in Atlanta too, right? Yeah, yeah, he does. I wonder if I'll ever Uber pool with Clark Howard. Oh, you might. You, you, you totally might. <laughs> Yeah, no, I hear stories about this all the time. Um, and I think what I've actually witnessed is the opposite, where I have friends who have Cirque du Soleil contracts, or they've, they went, they were incredibly, uh, talented acrobats. Mm -hmm. And so they spent their twenties in this kind of bubble. Mm. Um, and so they had a lot of money to spend. They had, pretty much, you know, no expenses because they were living in either Cirque du Soleil housing or it was they were given a budget and they had no worries about health insurance or anything like that. It's pretty it's a job. But again, they hit this age where then all of a sudden they couldn't perform anymore. They didn't want to. They wanted to settle down and they didn't have any money. I'm wondering, (laughs) like, how... What is that mindset if you ever come across people like that? And how do people change that? That's a lack of planning. You know, it's mm-hmm. a lack of of forward thinking, um, mm-hmm. thinking about the future. Uh, the way one thing that helps is to, especially if you have the type of personality that can be like a little bit of a people pleaser, mm-hmm. it helps to think about future you. And like you're doing a favor for future you. So you can almost conceptualize future you as a different person and you're taking care of future you. You know, they've done research to show that um, if you see a picture of yourself that's digitally aged, uh, you're actually more likely to save money and to to pay for retirement because you have this this concept of who you're going to be when you're in your 50s or 60s. So there are apps where you can just 
where you can do this for free. You can just download an app and take a picture of yourself and the app will digitally age you. I did this and I remember I took the picture and you know how like you never like a, you never like pictures of yourself, right? Right. So yeah. I took this picture of myself. I took a selfie and I looked at it and I was like, ew, I, ew, I don't look good in this selfie. And then I digitally aged it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, never mind. I do look good in the selfie. <laughs> oh, that's great. I think I'm too vain for that. That that sounds insane. Did it help you? I mean, obviously, I don't think you really needed that kind of help. But what impact did it have? Aside have, from now uh, you have an appreciation yeah, of your... Yeah, honestly, yeah. It made <laughs> me <vitality>. appreciate... Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. It made me appreciate the 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 now more, I guess. I guess it had the opposite effect. <laughs> Before I got on this call with you, I was talking to my roommate and I was like, I'm about to talk to this uh, woman who's in uh, financial advice and is a advocate of financial planning. And I asked her, like, what would you ask someone like that? And her first question was very much along the lines of like a vampire screenwriter response. It was like, how do you sleep at night like that? Mm. And then the other thing she said, she was like, I think that if I talked to someone like that, I would probably just cry. I was like, why? And she was like, well, I don't even know where I would start. And I asked her, I was like, why do you think that is? And she said, because my parents didn't really have a lot of financial planning. I've had friends say, oh, my parents never taught me anything about money. And, and mine didn't either. Like, we never talked about money. I just saw them being extremely frugal. That was the thing I learned. I just watched them be super frugal. And the lesson that I picked up is be super frugal. The thing that I would say is it's not your fault, but it is your responsibility. Mm. You know, whatever you observed or learned as a child or whatever you didn't observe or learn as a child, like things that happened to you in childhood are not your fault. Mm -hmm. But now that you're an adult, it is your responsibility. And What's great about being an adult is that you can take charge, finally, like in a way that we couldn't when we were five or mm -hmm. eight or ten. Like now we finally have the opportunity to be in charge and to make those decisions and to break the cycle. But it all, it all goes back to you earn, you spend, and the difference between the two is that gap between the two like everything goes back to that gap. I, I like to say mind the gap, like playing mm -hmm. off the the London underground. Um, yeah. Mind the gap. Like that's really what it's all about. And and then once you have that gap, those, that gap is your savings. And, you know, with your savings, you can buy index funds. You can buy rental properties. You can just you can save a bunch of cash for a rainy day. You can do some combination of the above like that. Those decisions. uh come next. But you can't make those decisions until first you widen that gap between what you earn and what you spend. And it's it's really that fundamental. So once you've widened that gap, I think a lot of people would say as far as investing that it's too complicated. Oh, well, well fortunately, the least complicated thing is, statistically speaking, the also the thing that's most likely to succeed. The simplest thing is, is most likely to succeed. And when you try to make it more complicated, you actually end up uh, doing worse. And so what that simple thing is, it's called an index fund. Now, an index fund is basically a fund that holds every single stock that is traded in the U.S. So an S&P 5 100 index fund or a total stock market index fund, both of which you can get at, at a low fee brokerage like Vanguard. Those are basically funds that have every single thing that is out there on the market. And what that means is that the money that you invest in this total stock market index fund is going to do as well or as poorly as the overall market, like no better, no worse. All you need to do really at at it at the core is you can get one total stock market index fund one total bond market index fund and divide your money between those two and then leave it alone put more money in there but don't don't try to actively trade it don't don't try to do any fancy stuff like total stock market index fund total bond market index fund divide your money between the two and then, Interesting. and then, Would and that's it. Would you say that before a retirement account? 
oh, so a retirement account is the type of account that holds the investment. So the in, the uh, think of it as like coffee and a coffee mug. So a retirement account is the mug. The retirement account, like a 401k or a Roth IRA, mm -hmm. that's the coffee mug. And then the index fund is the coffee itself. But you can also get an index fund independently of a retirement account. So think of it like you can put coffee inside of a coffee mug or you can put coffee inside of a pint glass or you can put coffee all over your floor, right? Like it's still <laughs> That's what coffee. I did this morning. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So it's still coffee and that coffee can be put in different types of vessels or different types of containers. The coffee can be in a mug. It can be in a glass. It can be on a towel. It can be... You know, it's inside of a coffee pot. So the coffee is the index funds. And then the mug, like one mug could be a Roth IRA. One mug could be a 401k. One glass could be just a, a regular traditional like non-retirement investing account. Like those are all different types of cups or mugs out there. And so if you had someone who they were like, I have all this savings, I would invest it. Where do I invest it? And I know it's not always the simple. I feel like the Polypant answer would be like, well, what what aligns most with your values? What do you want to do with this money? So maybe I've just answered my own question, Paula. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but but if somebody is looking for a concrete answer, like if there's someone listening to this who's like, look, ju just tell me what to do. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the simplest thing, uh, there's a brokerage called Vanguard. Now, Vanguard is a co-op, which means that it's member owned. And so what that means is that there aren't a whole bunch of owners who own this thing. It, like every single person, if you open an account there, you're one of the owners. Every single one of the clients is a part owner. So that's what's cool about the way that Vanguard is set up, uh, is that it, it has that co-op structure. Uh, they also have very, very low cost index funds, like very, very low fee. The simplest thing to do is open a retirement account like a Roth IRA at Vanguard and then get just a total stock market index fund and a total bond market index fund. Or if you want it to be even simpler, figure out what year you want to retire and get a target date retirement fund. You could do that too at Vanguard. And only at Vanguard. Like at a lot of other places, there are a lot of other companies that have their target date funds are super expensive. But if you're at Vanguard, Vanguard's target date funds are cheap. Interesting. And you can pick any date through Vanguard for that? Uh, they're available in five-year increments. So you can do target retirement 2030 uh, the, if you think you're going to retire in the year 2030 or 2035 or 2040. Or, so you can do it in five-year increments. And so you just invest in that account and then at that time you can withdraw the money without penalty. So the penalties are associated with the type of mug that you choose, right. not the type of coffee. So a, right. a target fund is a type of coffee. It's a oh, flavor of coffee. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. I did not know about that. And then you started Afford Anything, the blog and the podcast. What, what was your inspiration for doing that? Because there are plenty of people who are financially independent or investing or are very smart about their money. Uh, you've kind of gone another step or put yourself out there as a resource. What's yeah. the impetus for that? Well, really, so the, the notion behind the behind afford anything is that you can afford anything but not everything. So every decision that you make is a trade-off against something else. And that it doesn't just apply to your money. It applies to everything in your life that is a limited resource. So it applies to your time, to your attention, to your energy. It applies to everything. Like it's Afford anything is, but not everything is fundamentally this question of what do you value? What do you prioritize? What are the trade offs and the opportunity costs involved? The idea to start it came when I was traveling because a lot of my friends would say, Oh, geez, I would love to travel. I'd love to go to, to Bali or to Thailand, you know, but I can't afford it. But these same friends were, they were getting manicures and pedicures. They were going to the bar and getting like $12 cocktails. They'd get their hair cut like at a, at a salon that's like $40. <laughs> yeah. I was like, you can afford it. You just can't afford to travel and to buy $12 cocktails and to get a pedicure 
and, 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 and. You're trying to afford everything and that's not going to fly. But if you No, that's a totally different website. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Somebody did start that website, by the way. Really? Yeah, someone actually started the website Afford Everything. Afford Everything? Oh my gosh. (laughs) I was, now I have to go look it up. That sounds hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. What's on that website? Oh I goodness. I, I haven't looked at it in years. <laughs> I just Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> You're like, darn it. Should have bought that domain real fast. <laughs> yeah. um, but what I'm interested in is that like this principle is very obvious and sometimes like I've seen friends who will post memes that are like, Oh yeah, you can't afford, you know, your circus class or you can't afford to see your friend in this show but you can afford to go out and buy a seven dollar beer um people post memes but you made an entire website (laughs) yeah (laughs) i felt felt very strongly about it like yeah because so many people you know i i mean so you heard my story about how when i wanted to do something but that thing was expensive I figured out a way like I wanted to study abroad. That was how all of this began. Um, it, it was like me wanting to study abroad was ha- was the, the origin. But that was super expensive. And so I, you know, thought about it. And I was like, well, I don't need to pay tuition for some study abroad program. Right. I can just save up money and fly to that country. And that's going to be a lot cheaper than than actually paying for a semester. So fundamentally what I did was I didn't say I can't. I asked, how can I? Mm. And that was how I transitioned from like instead of saying, oh, I I can't study abroad. So wow, poor me. I just don't have that kind of money. So life sucks. The end. Instead, I said, well, all right, how can I do this? Oh, well, Mm -hmm. I, I okay. maybe what I can do is I can save up some money and I can go overseas myself and then I graduated, I, and of course, I didn't have any money. So I said, well, okay, I, I can't travel right out of college because, but again, I didn't say, oh, I can't, and that's the end, and this is the end of my life forever. I said, okay, you know, I, I can't right now, but if I save up for the next three years, then I bet in three years I could, and so that was how that happened. And so all of it is like, instead of saying I can't, it's it's reframing I can't into how can I, and mm-hmm. figuring figuring it out. My final question, which I give to all of my guests, the thing I get asked the most as a circus performer is how did you become a circus performer? Because mm-hmm. people, it, there's very little resources to how people become circus performers. Um, and so the reason I created this podcast was kind of like um, for past me or people coming up in the industry who don't know, didn't come from a family and want to become circus artists or performers. So I always ask professionals and people who are have been quite successful in the industry what advice they would give to their younger selves Mm. as kind of a means to uh, help the people that I'm thinking of Uh, so it's not as relevant for you but I think it still actually could be quite helpful to people so what advice would you give to yourself at the beginning of your career or your journey I would say well a few things one is that emotional growth and professional growth and and investing growth like they're all one and the same if you lack confidence then that's going to hold you back when you're trying to start your own business when you're trying to become a freelancer when you're trying when you buy your first rental property if you lack confidence and you lack or or if you panic easily and you can't stay calm Uh, in stressful situations, or you have a hard time staying focused, or you're always a little bit antsy, like those things are going to really harm your ability to do a good job as a landlord, uh, as a freelancer, as a, you know, like these are all, these are all jobs and you, you either do them well or you do them poorly. In order to do them well, you know, you need to be in a, in an emotionally healthy space. And so, I would give myself the advice that like, don't think of the time that you spend on yoga or meditation or personal growth. Like, don't think of that as time spent away from growing your business or growing your investments like that. That's a really integral part of it. You will ultimately be the only person that holds yourself back uh, slash you will ultimately be the only person who 
pushes yourself upwards or forwards. Paula, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And thank you for all of your work and all you do. You are so inspiring. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I hope you have a great day. Thank you. You too. (laughs) Bye. All right. Bye. Oh, Paula, thank you so, so much for coming on the show. If you all start listening to her podcast, you'll hear that her interview episodes, she has question and answer episodes and interview episodes. And the interview format is very similar to mine because I basically stole her format. And Paula, if you're listening, I hope you're really flattered by that and not offended. Um, what she does, similar to me, is she introduces a guest, or what I do similar to her, is she introduces a guest, plays the interview, and then reviews in what she calls the key takeaways from the interview. Now, I don't call them key takeaways because sometimes I'm less journalistic at the end and I just kind of go off on my own rants. But today, with complete and total respect to Paula, I'll try to stick to that format. So what are the key takeaways from this interview with Paula, who doesn't own an ironing board? The first one is that the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves and others shape our financial practices. In the interview, Paula gives the example of the writer who believes rich people or people with control of their money were like vampires. If someone believes that rich people are evil or preying on other people, why would they want to be rich? Likewise, if someone believes that being an artist means life is a struggle and it's constantly difficult to make money, and then they observe something coming easily to someone else or if one is successful, they think of that person as less of an artist. I came up against a really interesting reaction uh, lately. As you all probably know, The Artist Athlete is not just a podcast. It's a company through which I produce and sell my own educational materials for aerialists, skills and methods I've learned and taught for years. And um, it's just in a different format. It's not one-on-one anymore. I can mass produce it. And a couple of months ago, I received a a message from someone accusing me of exploiting beginner aerialists because I was selling this information. Um, and it was, it was really hurtful to hear that. But in thinking along the lines of this episode, it felt very much like another money story that people tell themselves that there's only one path or one right way to learn, earn a living, being a teacher, being an artist. And if you stray from that, or if you're some way different, if you want to build a company, or if you want to take a different kind of action, you're not legit anymore. You're not credible. But if a person tells themselves that story and begin to, begins to internalize it, what opportunities are they missing out on? Artists are, by definition, incredibly creative people, and it constantly wows me that for all of our talent and skills, we can be so narrow-minded about money and the way we criticize others when they make theirs. Because ultimately, if we speak about others in this way, we begin to internalize those beliefs which block us from opportunities and planning for financial success. Remember, Paula's approach, she never said, I can't. In other words, she never looked at her circumstances and admitted defeat. She looked around and asked, how can I? But in order to ask, how can I, and be open to the multitude of answers that might come your way, you have to be very honest about the assumptions and the stories that you make about money and your identity. And I face this all the time. I still feel like I'm not legit or credible because I haven't spent, you know, five years training with Cirque and performing on stage and these huge arena tours. And um, it's something that I've really had to come to terms with and be honest to myself about what I can offer, but also give myself permission to offer that and allow the good things that come with offering that to come. 
The second key takeaway, and oh man, this episode is getting kind of long, but um, the other piece of wisdom that Paula dispensed was her top secret way to become a millionaire. She said, and listen closely because this is some innovative stuff here. Her advice, save your money. <laughs> Specifically, Paula defines saving money as the gap between what you earn and what you spend. That those are your savings. So if you earn uh, $1,500 and you spend 700 of those dollars, your savings is $800. And you can save in a couple different ways. You can make more money than your expenses. You can look at your life and try to eliminate unnecessary expenses. So um, Paula talked a lot about living very frugally. Or you can do a combination of both. So you can up your earnings and cut a little bit of your spendings. What you do with those savings is up to you. It's up to what your values are, what your long-term goals are. It's helpful to have some long-term goals to understand what you might want to save your money for. But Paula recommends that you invest that money. And um, this is something that's uh, pretty common. And I hear people say this all the time. Oh, rich people, they, their money works for them. But it's actually a little backwards to think of it that way. Um, people suppose that rich people invest. But actually, I think it works a bit more the other way, that people who invest are more likely to be quote unquote rich. And I don't really have a working definition for the word rich. I more prefer to think of things in terms of wealth. And you can measure your wealth as the amount of free time you have to dedicate your life to whatever you want, rather than trading your time for money. A great place to start researching about investment is are um, the Vanguard website. So the index funds that Paula was talking about um, are out of Vanguard. There are a couple of different companies. I'm actually not with Vanguard. I'm with a different company. But uh, Vanguard has really great resources on investing. They have a blog on their website, and it's totally free to access. You don't have to invest anything with them to get the information. So I highly recommend, um, if you're interested in investing your savings, going to Vanguard.com, V A N G. U-A-R-D, Vanguard.com, and checking them out. If you want to find Paula Pant online, you can go to her website, her blog, which also has some great information about investing in real estate and uh, stock market investing. She is at affordanything.com. She has a podcast. It's called The Afford Anything Podcast. On Instagram, she's at Paula Pant. For aerial training tips and inspiration, you can follow me, the underscore artist underscore athlete on Instagram. My website is www.theartistathlete.com and I'm on Facebook, The Artist Athlete. And as I said at the beginning of the show, you can go to Friends of the Artist Athlete podcast. It's a Facebook group and um, I'd love some feedback on this uh, interview, what you liked, what you didn't like. I do have a couple of other interviews scheduled with people in kind of the finance, personal finance world to continue to encourage artists to take control of their finances in order to build a stronger uh, circus and artistic community. However, next week on the podcast, I have juggler Wes Peden. Uh, so definitely tune in for that. It's a really fun interview. Until then, I hope you guys have a great week, and I'll talk at you later, friends, fans, and enemies. The Artist Athlete Podcast is supported solely by donations from people like you. Here's what some of those people have to say. Hey there, friends, fans, and enemies. This is Chris Alston, Patreon of the Artist Athlete Podcast. Straps artist and Lyra performer and acrobat out of Greenville, South Carolina. 
So, if you're ever passing through, make sure to stop in and see me and my friends. We have a wonderful space, and we'd love to see you. Hi, my name is Erica Lee. I'm from St. Louis, Missouri, and I'm an aerialist. I teach performing arts to elementary school during the day and do pole and slings and rope by night. I really, really like the Artist Athlete podcast because it gives me a lot of circus goals to look forward to. It gives me a lot of insight on what's going on around the world in circus. And um, that's why I'm Patreon. Hello, all. Thank you for tuning in to the Artist Athlete podcast. I am Opal Schwartz from Minneapolis, Minnesota. If you're ever in the cities, feel free to stop by the Aviary Minneapolis. It's a great time. With that, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week. And goodbye.